Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. First, I would like to thank you for your letters and comments. We very much appreciate receiving them. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Elliot Lander and Dr. Dan Olesnicki. Uh, who are going to be talking to us about the future, hopefully, of treatment of various illnesses and um, diseases. Uh, Dr. Elliot uh, is a certified diplomat and board certified urologist of the American Board of Urology. He is the co-founder and medical director of the California Stem Cell Treatment Center and the Cell Surgical Network. Dr. Bohdan Oesnicki has a board certification in internal and emergency medicine. He studied molecular cell biology and molecular genetics at New York University. Today, Dr. Oesnicki is helping blaze the way in regenerative medicine with doctors Berman and Lander at the Cell Surgical Network and California Stem Cell Treatment Center. Uh, it is just a pleasure having you and I can't wait to hear about your research. Over to you, Dr. Lander and Dr. Olusnicki. Outstanding. We have a, um, a PowerPoint presentation um, that we would probably want to start quickly because there's a lot of information. What we want to do is really demystify the, the, the stem cell therapy that we're doing. And um, again, we, you gave us a great introduction. This is the two of us in, uh, in the area where we live, in the Palm Springs area, um, just in case you forgot our faces from a few seconds ago. And I'll turn it over to Elliot here. Oh, yeah, we um, have a picture of our other partner. This is our other partner, uh, and um, we all know him for the Hippocratic Oath. Very briefly about our history, uh, Dr. Berman was working with uh, world experts who were using stem cells derived from fat, and they were using it for cosmetic purposes to enhance fat so that when you do a fat transfer or fat graft to restore to some disfigured area, the fat would survive. Otherwise, most of the fat dies away. But if you put stem cells in the fat, it, it enhances and it, and it survives and lives and you get a better outcome. But those stem cells can not only enhance other fat, those stem cells that come from fat can be used for therapeutics as well. And that's something that Dr. Berman, Berman and I understood very early on. And so we set up very complex protocols for various conditions to see if those stem cells could be used clinically to help people who are sick, not just for cosmetic purposes. And uh, the whole surgery, the whole concept was based on doing a surgical procedure where we take a tiny bit of fat in the operating room. We do just what the cosmetic surgeons do. We isolate the stem cells using some very simple basic equipment. And then we return the stem cells to the patients using either you know, complex or even simple deployments such as injections into joints or intravenously or into certain organs. And um, very early on, it became apparent to us that uh, we have something I call lightning in a bottle. It's very, very powerful. It accelerates natural healing. And uh, we've been doing this now for 11 years and on, on thousands of patients. And we have an interesting uh, experience we want to share with you today. <clears throat> and based on that, I'm actually the new guy who joined the team. I started doing this in 2015 because I was tired of managing just chronic disease and not being able to actually heal anyone or mitigate uh, the disease. And the reality is um, as a uh, molecular cell biologist um, it, with, with at least some training there, um, I realized that um, aging is not a matter of destruction of the joints or destruction of the tissue. Um, you know, as a child, you do things to your joints, et cetera, that um, is way more punishing than you do as an adult, but you have the ability to heal. So natural aging and disease is the inability to heal and that's why I joined the team in 2015. So I've been doing this for six years now. Um, we also are fighting to preserve the right of people to their own living cells um, uh, with the FDA. And we've been in litigation with the FDA to preserve this right, which is as significant as uh, uh, the Roe versus Wade trial in the Supreme Court. Uh, we've been doing that since 2017 and are currently still to preserve the right to our own cells. Uh, the technology that Dr. Berman and I sort of uh, developed has been uh, 
used uh, all around the world. Uh, we've licensed it out for Europe. Uh, some of them are in very advanced facilities, but some of the more interesting places we've been, uh, you can use this simple bedside technology in, in any conditions, in third world conditions with poor resources. Uh, it doesn't matter. This, is, this uh, allows people to have access to stem cell technology for very, very little money and uh, in, a, in a very safe and effective way. And I thought that's probably an, an important message that we're gonna focus on today uh, for the next 40 minutes or so to explain how we can accomplish that. And as long as you have electricity and some shelter, this can be done in a, in a field tent um, in, in the field on a mission. It can be done in the middle of the Andes. It can be done in the middle of the rainforest. Um, it, it is not difficult technology. So if you look at what some of the things that we need stem cells for, we call them the enemies of human survival. And you, you know, if you briefly look at the list, you see all the things that basically prevent us from staying on the planet as individuals. Um, any, any and all of these things can only be at the end of the day mitigated by stem cells. Stem cells are your healing cells. Uh, drugs, surgeries, uh, medical inter interventions, they create milieus and conditions where healing is permissible, but the only thing that actually can heal you on a cellular level is your own stem cells. So there's red, the, excuse me, the white cells, there's the, the army that keeps out, you know, the, what we call the, the defense system, which is your immune cells. And to the extent things get through the immune cells and damage your body, you need repair cells. And those are the stem cells. So stem cells are very interesting because they also contain uh, signaling factors and um, all sorts of different proteins are secreted from there that will cause regeneration and healing of the tissue. Um, and they're, but they're pluripotent. So that means it, they can't, they're not just there to heal one tissue. They can heal multiple different types of defective tissue and sometimes uh, create living organs or portions of living organs. So, and it's the important thing here is it doesn't heal with scar tissue, it heals with organ tissue. And that's the most important thing. So you could, you know, if you had to define a stem cell, you know, there's certain biologic definitions. One is that obviously they are repair cells, but they can differentiate, which means mature and grow into other cells. So they they retain stemness, which is their most primitive form, and um, that allows them to uh, form other cells. And they can form a number of other cells, but they can also form other stem cells, and that's called proliferation. So the two main essential biologic features of stem cells is differentiation and proliferation. And all of these cells actions are determined by a really complex, but really interesting signaling system that uh, Dan, Dr. Elisnecki mentioned just now. It's a combination of um, proteins, you know, protein growth factors, which are peptides, also little pieces of genetic material and, and other things. So it's a really interesting uh, signal system that drives their, their uh, you know, their function. And they are little repair robots for your body. And the, what you also may have heard of is a term called exosomes. And exosomes just means that they are extracellular uh, messages that, that uh, cells put out. The key thing about stem cells is those exosomes are repair and growth exosomes. They're repair and growth signals. They're not there to cause cancer. They're not there to cause other things like inflammation. They're there to repair and uh, create the appropriate organ tissue to repair that organ. So um, they also are very rich in exosomes. Um, just again, it's a little bit of a boring slide, but just to give you background, the stem cells we're talking about are called adult mesenchymal stem, cell, stem cells. They come from bone marrow fat, which has 500 times the amount of stem cells per volume than bone marrow has, and even umbilical products. The problem with umbilical products is almost always they're not your own, but they are a good source of stem cells. Then there's engineered cells, which is what uh, usually uh, a business model, people will uh, uh, patent and, and change cells to form certain types of stem cells. And then there's even one called IPS cells where they take mature cells and run them backwards into immature cells. So that's also something that would have to be patented and FDA approved. So, but again, what we're doing is we're doing surgical techniques with bone marrow and adipose fat derived. So again, autologous means your own cells. They're from your own body. 
there's enough autologous cells to, to supply every single person on this planet for very little money. When you start getting into allergenic, which means cells from other people, you have to get them from banks. They have to grow them. They're very expensive. They're difficult to get. Uh, it's not easily accessible for uh, many people who live. It's hard even for people in America, North America. Uh, it's extremely hard for people in third world countries uh, uh, to, to get access to uh, a cell product. But all of us have our own cells in them. They have our own DNA and we can never reject them. They're perfectly designed by our bodies for ourselves to repair ourselves. And certainly the allogeneic stem cells that are from other humans, there is a potential for graft versus host reaction. And a certain <laughs> amount of those people do reject and they do die from the uh, graft versus host reaction. So that's, um, that's another thing to consider. So um, just as we said earlier, this, they sit around, they don't do anything until they get a signal that something is damaged and then they go to work and they, they work in a few different ways, but one is to fix things. Another is to become new cells. Uh, another is to decrease inflammation. And another one that's very important is to modulate the immune system, which means that if you have an autoimmune condition where your body's own immune system is turned against your own cells, can mitigate that and dampen it down so that uh, you can protect your own body from your own immune system. Anyway, over here, you can see that um, the stem cells here were labeled with technetium 99, so we can pick them up on uh, a radiograph. And you'll see that those stem cells move around the body and they go, they go and they home to different areas where repair is needed or there is damage. So they're smarter than we are as physicians, and they, we still can't explain how they know to go where they need to go, but that is for researchers to figure out over years, but they are alive, they are your cells, and they're smarter than anyone. Yeah. They move to where they need to. Yeah, uh, well, that is so amazing. Just the overview of our project, which is what's different than almost everyone else who's interested in stem cells, is we don't want, we're not looking for a drug model. What we're looking to do is just take each patient and surgically transfer stem cells from their own fat, which has the most stem cells per body volume, and take those stem cells, isolate them from the fat, and then move them around the body to another part of the body to help that part heal. It's a completely different model. It's a physician's model of taking care of patients rather than a business model of drug production. So, and it's no different than any other organ transplant. It's just smaller. Uh, what we call the, the stem cells from fat is stromovascular fraction. It's the part of your fat that has stem cells. Uh, we use an enzyme uh, called collagenase, which is something that breaks down the connective tissue to release the stem cells, so it liberates them. And uh, what's left over doesn't have any fat in it. What we're giving patients back is the cells, but not the fat. Sometimes we call stromovascular fraction the orchestra because there's actually at least four different types of stem cells in there, along with another uh, group, many other groups of cells that help form blood vessels and fight infection and support your immune system and things like that. And the body has evolved to do this on its own rather than us picking one small part of it. This is a more complete solution to healing. So the concept behind what we're trying to accomplish is what the military would call a surge. A surge is a concentration of, of, of resources into a small place over a small period of time. Your stem cells come out of your bone marrow a little at a time all day long looking for problems. But if we can get a, a huge volume of them from your fat and inject that into a damaged area, then we've created a surge. We'll show you in the next slide. So the idea is a, a dripping faucet versus a water hose. The water hose, so we're, we're making cells available to you that were, that were locked in the collagen matrix. So they weren't available to you before, unless there was some local damage, and we are able to use them systemically now for other parts of your body. And that drip gets less and less as we age, which is why we age and we are unable to heal. So this is catching on. This is not something we're just doing in Southern California. Uh, the technology Dr. Berman and I developed is, um, you know, we have well over 150 clinics around the world that are currently using this for their patients. And we've authored quite a few papers on the science behind stromovascular fraction. So there's a lot of safety data supporting it. Uh, it's actually incredibly safe. Uh, we really haven't had any serious problems. And then, um, you know, it seems like we're able to use it for more and more things. We're trying it for many different conditions. And we're learning as we go. So this is what the procedure, he's removing 
with a syringe, which um, is a, a mechanical syringe that causes suction to uh, um, actually pull out the fat. And we take out about two ounces of fat from each side, which is 60 uh, cc's. And you'll see about this much. This is about 55 right here. And this is fat from the patient. Under local, we use local anesthetic. This is not done in the operating room per se. This can be done in the field. It's all done under local anesthetic. Using collagenase and uh, centrifugation, as well as incubation, it is, with these very simple instruments, um, it is actually isolated as far as the stem cells and the stromovascular fraction. Uh, we won't bore you with the exact technique, but it takes about an hour and a half to do so. You can see that we're, um, we're putting in uh, the collagenase and we're using it essentially as an enzymatic scalpel. Um, the holy grail for medicine moving it into the 21st and the 22nd century is to um, decrease patient risk, have surgeries um, and medical procedures um, less invasive and uh, work on a smaller level. Rather than using um, a, a big hammer, we use a very precision tool and these are stem cells. So that's how we use this enzymatic scalpel to release the, the cells. And what you see over here is it's essentially a closed system. Um, there's no surgical procedure that is completely closed because just from the surgery, you are exposing certain things to air. But um, using clean and sterile technique, what we do is minimize exposure and the, the possibility of transmitted disease. You can see right here that the uh, stromovascular fraction is passed through a filter. And with these locking syringes, it is essentially a closed uh, system that can deliver the unaltered cells, which are now free to repair the body. So these are cells that are naturally found in your body. We haven't changed them. We haven't engineered them. We haven't done anything to them. They're, they're used fresh. They're your own DNA. It's just that they were locked up in the collagen matrix. And using this closed syringe system, we are able to free them up. So it's, it's actually a pretty significant technological breakthrough. And it puts regenerative medicine into the hands of clinicians in the field. So it's, uh, you know, it's, not, it's not being filtered down through the pharma model. It's being uh, one off, one, a single, it's called precision medicine taking care of patients with their own bodies, one patient at a time. Um, originally, we were using cells from bone marrow, uh, but now, that, as I said earlier, there's 500 times as many cells in fat, and the ones from bone marrow are genetically older. They don't grow as fast. They don't uh, you know, duplicate as fast. So the ones from fat are preferable, and bone marrow hurts a little bit when you extract the cells. So if we can, we use fat on almost every patient. Oh, just a quick slide on uh, bone marrow. The number of stem cells goes down as you age into your sixth decade, eighth decade. And with fat, it stays stable. So the stem cell numbers as you get older aren't efficient because you're older. And it's by dumb luck that those stem cells are trapped in your fat and we can access them as we age. So our, our centers have performed over 13,000 cases with no serious complications. And we, can, we uh, track data on all of this. Now, um, we, the patient selection is, is straightforward. We have protocols for certain conditions, like, for example, maybe um, you know, kidney disease or low back pain. But we're also often trying a number of different conditions. So we encourage, patient, we encourage you know, investigating uh, the uses of SVF on patients who have uh, conditions that aren't on our standard protocols as well. One thing we do exclude is if they have an active dental infection, because that could lead to seeding of the liposuction or the target site. But even people on blood thinners, we, it's such a minor surgery that we don't stop their blood thinners. So I've done this on many people in their 90s. They tolerate it great. They have, it's, it's about as simple and small a surgery as I know how to do. So looking at total knee replacement, um, this is a, a good, surgical uh, procedure to look at because there's tons of knees done and we've done a lot of knees. Um, if you look at total knee replacement uh, in the United States, it's a very costly procedure, uh, both in patient uh, illness days and uh, physical costs. So a single knee in the United States, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, costs forty-five dollars to $70,000 per knee to do the surgery. Uh, the major complication rate is 3.5%. That includes infection. They may need to take out the, uh, the knee replacement. And then uh, and later on, after they treat the infection like osteomyelitis, they'll have to redo the surgery. Minor complication rate is 20%, 19.3% uh, to be exact. 
Uh, major bleeding requiring blood transfusion is 17.2%. Hospital readmission, which is another $100,000 for a complication uh, per readmission minimum, is 4.7%. And there are 754,000 uh, total knee surgeries done in 2017 uh, in the United States. So just think of the amount of money that goes into this. Um, Go ahead. Oh, in, in our uh, research group, uh, we uh, used, uh, you know, the SVF for knee conditions. Uh, we treated um, uh, 2,683 uh, patients with knee arthritis um, with SVF using the same protocol that we just showed you earlier. And um, we had 82% success rate. So those are people that otherwise would have either been on pain medicines or restricted mobility or had gone on to surgery or arthroscopy. Most of these patients are done within about two hours um, from harvest to deployment, and they drive home, and they have zero downtime. So that, that paper we published two years ago. Um, this particular picture, I know that, that it's small print, but it's, it's from that paper, and it shows the safety of the treatments, and that's adverse events, but they were all incredibly minor, most of them related to minor pain at the liposuction site, but there was no hospitalizations, no deaths, no blood transfusions, no pulmonary problem. Overall success rate when we track all these people over time is 83%. And you can see the graphs there. And, and the results were sustained. They don't go down in a few months like injecting steroids where you get a temporary fix. And you can see over here, prior to SVF deployment on weight-bearing uh, knee radiographs, they have to be weight-bearing because uh, if there's not weight on the knees, you can be deceived by uh, the space in the knee. But if you take a look at the radiograph with the left knee, where the arrow is pointed, um, it's, uh, you actually can see that the, the dark space, which is the cartilage, um, has actually grown and repaired. So you went from bone on bone to actually having some articulation in that joint. And uh, that patient, patient four months later is pain-free. We also give intravenous uh, holistic treatment with every, if you come in just for a knee or a hip, you still get an intravenous infusion because the cells are so smart, they home into wherever there's damage. So they may go to other parts of that joint or they may go to other parts of the body and uh, help try to you know, repair things that may be also uh, damaged in some way or degenerated. And you never know what you're gonna get. Apparently, um, after I started doing stem cells for myself, uh, my friends told me that my hair grew back and back. So uh, I didn't expect that, didn't do it for hair, but you never know where it's gonna go and repair. I guess my, my, my stem cells thought my hair was a problem, so. Um, we also, one of the, you know, we, we've tackled so many different conditions, but we use knees and as an example, we also wanna talk about low back pain because that is so common. Uh, you know, we looked in the literature, it's always in the top 10 of diseases and injuries that account for the most disability and based on worldwide statistics. Um, if you look in industrialized countries, uh, the lifetime prevalence of low back pain is almost two thirds of people. And it's about 5% per year. And uh, a lot of those people wind up having surgeries. Usually it's a lumbar fusion, which costs $26,000 per level. They never do one level. It's usually between one and five levels. You know? So this is a very expensive thing to fix and it hits most people. Now, my wife recently had a C2 to T2 fusion. So that's an eight level fusion. And by the time the hospitalization, the surgery was done, that was $365,000, uh, just to give you an idea. This is from our database. We have a database with all of the you know, 13,000 plus patients we've treated. So when you uh, query the database and ask for cervical spine success rates, uh, it's 85%. And lumbar 76. Uh, these numbers are a couple years old. If we did them again, they'd be close though. It, it varies from month to month, but we're, we're always in the uh, low, usually around the low 80s is about what we're, what we're hitting. So that's pretty successful for no complications. And this is not something that you need to recover from. This is a same day procedure and it's very minimally invasive deployment. Yeah, needle-based radiographic guided deployments. That's a back injection. So there's also neurodegenerative diseases that uh, we treat. And again, when you look at these diseases in this list, um, most of these are uh, terminal diseases. So, um, Bell's palsy is more cosmetic than anything else, 
but it, it causes a lot of um, annoyance and suffering to people because they can't close their eyelids and you get uh, eye desiccation and, it, and you look like you've had a stroke, but people are very uh, self-conscious. But certainly ALS, spinal cord injuries, stroke, Alzheimer's, uh, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, th those are uh, regarded as terminal diseases and peripheral neuropathy is horrible. Um, just for one example on the list, um, we did a, uh, a side project with a group of neurosurgeons at a local hospital uh, to inject stromovascular fraction into the ventricles of the brain. The ventricles are the fluid filled central area of the brain, the, the inside of the brain. Uh, they make all the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, it's called the cerebral spinal fluid. We inject directly through the skull into that uh, using a neurosurgical device uh, directly into the ventricles. And we did it as sort of a, you know, investigational project on people who were basically had, uh, you know, life threatening conditions. We treated 10 Alzheimer's dementia patients. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Alzheimer's is extremely common. One out of nine people get some level of uh, dementia. Uh, it's considered a fatal condition and uh, it's, it's associated with a steady decline in cognitive function. It's very predictably a uh, steady decline. So it has typically a very flat slope. And, and it's a big toll on resources because it really um, underscores the issues related to elder care uh, in the, across the entire world. Uh, on these patients, we had 10 of them. Um, this is a publication you see from that particular study we did. It was published in a prominent uh, journal. And uh, it's based, and now based on this work, they're doing, they're, they're developing a line of stem cells through more of a pharma model to see if they can reproduce some of this with custom cells. But with SVF, it, it worked pretty well. We got eight out of 10 patients with Alzheimer's either stabilized or improved, and they had to get cells every two months. This is not a one-time thing like we do for a knee or a back. This is a continuous uh, infusion of you know, repeat treatments. And if repeat treatments can be done by doing liposuction again, or we can store some cells in a bank and then use those, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we also treated multiple sclerosis, and um, what we found uh, is 52% of our patients had a reduction in their um, uh, MISS-29. Lung disease, COPD, it has no known treatment or cure. And we got two thirds of those patients responding. Again, you know, there's no side effects, so there's um, a big advantage to use it. The Regenitrac is the, uh, the trade name of our database. It queries the patients directly to ask them how they're doing every three months. Um, and it asks them if they had any adverse events, how their pain is, you know, that way we can just track, not only did they re respond, but did they respond? How about three years later? How about five years later? Did they ever develop cancer or any other problems? And we use that to determine what protocols work and what doesn't. So that's a very powerful tool. Um, the, the, the thing I guess we're, we compete with, I mean, we, we consider what we have to be a disruptive technology. I think a lot of people would agree with that. And, uh, and what it's disrupting is uh, the pharma model of, of using medications. Uh, we're not anti-pharma. Uh, I'm, um, I'm on medicines. My patients are on medicines. We, we don't stop people's medicines unless they don't need them anymore. But uh, we are also keenly aware that pharmaceuticals is... Uh, a challenge for in terms of access and price, uh, and they don't always fix everything. They don't cure everything, and sometimes they they help some things. Sometimes they cause a lot of adverse side effects. So let's talk about the autologous stem cell procedure. So again, uh, autologous means it's your own cells, and essentially you have an unlimited amount of stem cells that will um, uh, really promote your own healing. Our procedure takes about two hours. It's minimally invasive. It can be done by just about anyone with medical training in the field. Um, if you have a, a tent and you have some electricity in the field, um, it, it is very inexpensive and you can, you can still do it there. Um, it's very safe with minimal side effects and the clinical results are very uh, predictable, sustainable and effective. So here's the economics. Uh, the economists might enjoy this slide. Uh, it's a simple supply and demand problem. Uh, over, remember all the things that cause, you know, that the enemies of survival, those accumulate over your lifetime and that results in cellular damage. And as you age, you have more and more cellular damage. So your demand for repair cells and repair increases over time. 
but your supply, which is mostly from your bone marrow, almost all, goes down because the bone marrow depletes in quality and quantity over time. So as your need goes up, your supply goes down, and that's one of the reasons why people die. But we now have the technology to create an almost unlimited amount of those cells. So yeah, what, what Dr. Olesnecki is talking about is at the time we take fat out and process it, we can take a little extra fat, send it to a, um, a, a bank that uses GMP. GMP means good manufacturing practices. It's like the same kind of conditions like a clean room that you use to create farmers and growing them. And then you can make a little army of them. You can make hundreds and hundreds of millions of them in these clean room facilities and little Petri dishes. And this is your own personal cell line. We've done this for thousands of patients. Uh, these cells can last forever at 180 degrees below zero, and they can be used for repeat treatments like the people who are getting cells every two months. They can be used for prevention, just you know, some people take them because they think it helps their wellness and health. And it can be used for interventions like people who are sick who need multiple treatments but don't have the ability or interest or money to have repeat liposuctions. So it gives us a, a tool that we can use to uh, treat chronic diseases over time. And for an example, I have chronic Lyme disease, which is stage four, um, which is the worst that it is. And uh, I'll be receiving 40 million of my own stem cells from the stem cell bank IV tomorrow. So uh, we call that bioinsurance because it is a form of insurance. People purchase insurance so that if there's a calamity, they'll have the resources required to address that problem. And we think of illness, sickness, uh, heart attacks, strokes, motor vehicle accidents, all those things. We think of them as medical calamities. And um, you know, you, having your own cells available, which are your repair cells in high numbers that can be you know, used as a, a mega surge, so to speak, uh, when you need them the most is a powerful tool. And of note, um, Dr. Lander had COVID-19 this year and uh, he, he got it very badly. Uh, it affected his lungs very, very severely. And we were able to give Dr. Lander uh, 350 million, 250, his, uh, 250 million of his own stem cells over time. So rather than ending up with pulmonary fibrosis, he was able to heal with his own lung tissue. This was obviously unexpected, but because we had the cells and there were case reports of uh, SVF within our network that were healing people with uh, pulmonary symptoms with COVID-19 and the cytokine storm, we started giving it to Dr. Lander and it saved his life in our opinion. So this is on the left is a picture from 1970. This is uh, for information technology. This is um, computer processing, you know, 50 years ago. And of course <laughs> on the right, we have an equivalent amount of computer processing power, but it's in the hands of people. You don't need to be a university or a large business or a government agency to have you know, a warehouse full of computer banks, you can have a laptop that you can put in your briefcase and take with you anywhere you go. That's information technology that revolutionized what we do digitally. We think we can do the same thing with healthcare. Uh, instead of a you know, $20 million stem cell lab at a university, um, you can have um, those small syringes, a little local anesthetic, and a cheap centrifuge and incubator. high numbers of fresh, healthy stem cells that perfectly match your body. Um, and what you get from the lab will never be, almost never be from your own body. It would never be, the, it would never be as good because it's not your DNA. So what we have is even better now because not only is it cheap, portable, easily accessible, easy to use, easy to train, um, you know, easy to, to, to transport. It's, uh, it's just, it's, it's, I think it's the wave of the future in terms of uh, a medical technology. Now, will there be cells that are come from pharma in terms of specialized cells that are patented and engineered and used for certain purposes? Absolutely, but they'll always be expensive. They'll always be relatively inaccessible to large segments of the population. And that's why we think this is important to talk to your group about today, because I think the UN is really interested in looking at solutions for people who don't have access to the the best resources all the time. And you know that this maybe could be part of that solution. So um, the, again, we wanna really get everyone here to think differently. There's a paradigm shift, um, the way we need to think about aging and disease. So aging and disease is an inability to heal 
more so than uh, just wear and tear. Uh, loss of stem cells will lead to degeneration and disease. And our stem cells are as vital to our existence as food and water. We just haven't been thinking on that small level. Um, the, the healing technology that's always been in our body, um, by dumb luck, just happens to be stored in your fat. And it can be easily accessed and harnessed with very simple technology. And it is very cost effective and scalable. Right now, it costs more than, than we hope in the future because we're doing it on a very small level. As uh, we scale and we have um, uh, really a, a larger amount of people doing this, the cost per treatment will, will actually be decreased. And that's about it. Um, let's see, it's in the slideshow. That is absolutely, absolutely wonderful presentation. It is, uh, I just been glued to your screen and I'm so very happy that you were able to come. Um, because we are really trying uh, to bring as much information as possible, especially uh, to the UN and the diplomats uh, that uh, are interested in that. And our own interns who we uh, have from pretty much many parts of the world. Uh, so uh, here I have a bunch of questions. Um, and the first question is, um, at what level artificial intelligence, what? At what level is artificial intelligence implemented into the medicine? Artificial intelligence is actually um, now starting to work with medicine. We work with um, a, uh, a number of, we work with one very large radiology group that is uh, uh, the four, four, one of the forerunners in artificial intelligence working with the original Google team. Um, we're also working on creating other artificial intelligent databases based on regenerative medicine. And that's, uh, it's still in its infancy. Um, but again, this is stuff we need to build from the ground up because um, pharma is not doing that. Uh, we're trying to use AI to bring it to the people around the globe. And we're calling other people to help us. What foundations around the world use stem cells to treat newborns? And are they used at all with this population? So they really, um, most of our experiences with adults um, with injuries and disease, newborns do have quite a bit of stem cells uh, to begin with, but um, that is something that is um, really hasn't been done very much. Um, there is some, uh, some treatment of teenagers uh, that we do depending on what their condition is. There's also a lot of data out of um, Israel and around the world that's showing promise uh, with stem cells being given for um, autism. Um, and uh, there's, uh, that's still being studied, but there is emerging data uh, in, in the pediatric literature, uh, especially on autism. So we're excited to see what else uh, is going to be studied. But personally, uh, Elliot and I focus mostly on adults. Uh, another question, have you ever witnessed any stem cells being unsafe or unstable uh, when injure, injected into the human body? So that's a very common question and that's been very well studied. Again, um, you will see tumors grow with uh, embryonic cells. Uh, that's one of the reasons we don't use them in the United States. They're also harvested from fetuses. So there are big ethical concerns there. So anyway, the, the cells that we use are adult, uh, fully differentiated stem cells, and they have essentially zero tumor potential. Um, the worst thing that could happen is essentially uh, if we did something wrong, um, the cells were not viable, um, there would still be proteins that help you heal. But uh, that's why we haven't had any adverse effects um, really to date in all those patients that we've treated. Uh, here's another one. Have you used uh, any of your uh, program to treat Crohn's disease? Yes. We, we've had uh, a number of patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And um, we're getting some good results. Uh, in some ways, the treatment is, uh, seems to be close to the effects of what we call the biologics. The biologic agents are very, very expensive and 
very dangerous drugs because they have a lot of drug side effects. And um, we think we can um, at least lower the need for the requirements for biologics. Um, and uh, there's a big role for uh, stroma vascular fraction in uh, autoimmune uh, bowel conditions. And it's, again, you have to think like a doctor, you have to think like a surgeon. When somebody has a bout of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, the bowel is being attacked and it's damaged. So the timing of the stem cells is also very important. You want the bowel to heal with bowel and not scar tissue because the scar tissue leads to adhesions and all these other problems that will cause you problem. So after a flare or during a flare, is when you actually wanna inject those stem cells, not way down the line. So if you know somebody's having a Crohn's flare, you give them the stem cells so the body can actually heal with normal uh, gut tissue. Well, that's very important. And uh, there's a couple of people that I know that are, uh, have to worry about that constantly. Uh, this is a question uh, from Ukraine. Uh, in Ukraine, the stem cells are used for rejuvenation. How safe and effective are they? Is there an age where this procedure should start? So the, the cells, um, it, it, the, the answer is it depends on what the cells are. If they're your cells, they're very safe. There's essentially no downside, whether they're bone marrow or uh, fat derived, there's essentially really no danger. You can't hurt anyone by doing that. A lot of wellness and uh, aesthetics are being done with this, uh, in my knowledge, in Ukraine and Russia, and it does work. The issue is if they are embryonic, um, and if you're, they're being taken from fetuses or embryos, those have the, the, um, the danger, uh, potential danger of growing tumors. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Uh, all right. Uh... Is the treatment by stem cells safe and secure, or is it still in the experimental stages? Well, basically, you answered that question, but. We don't truly understand it at this point, um, but it's not very experimental because um, stem cells have been around as long as uh, lizards have walked the earth. Um, you know, that's how the body normally heals. All we're doing is a surgical procedure and freeing up your stem cells that are otherwise trapped. So, you know, it's, it's not experimental in the fact that it is just normal human physiology. Um, our procedure is considered experimental, um, but uh, it's under research uh, protocol. But in reality, all you're doing is um, freeing up cells that have a natural purpose in your body to begin with. Well, uh, I completely agree with you that uh, your research and your uh, uh, clinical work is absolutely amazing. It, you seem to be covering so many of the, uh, how to you say, the aging problems and the uh, utilization of one's own ability to be able to heal it reminds me of one of the Star Trek episodes. Absolutely. <laughs> So here is a, here is another, but this is a, a thank you for a wonderful presentation. As far as I understand, the mystification stem cell is an important discovery in medicine. Will all countries be able to provide such an opportunity for the populations? That's and on okay. what grounds will doctors be able to offer patients this modification uh, if they are not wealthy? <laughs> So the reality is, is very simple. With scales of economy, the, at, at, when we can decrease the cost of manufacturing for the kits that we use and, the, say, the centrifuges, the, the cost to set up a stem cell clinic or a, a treatment center will decrease over time. Um, this is absolutely somebody can do in any and every country, whether it's a third world Caribbean country, if you're looking in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if you're looking in Asia where there are really poor people, clinics can be set up and, uh, and people can be treated for very, very small cost. Um, this is technology that is available to everyone on the planet because the medicine or the, it's not really medicine, the cells that we're looking for are in your body to begin with. You, already, you are the, the biggest 
um, resource of your own or the, the depository of your own stem cells. Um, and they can be harvested, isolated, and put wherever you need them to heal. And then over time, the banking can certainly be brought down in price so that you can receive uh, repeat treatments at a fraction of the price of care for your life. Absolutely. Okay, uh, that, that is very, very good to know because a lot of the people will be worried. I mean, if you go to Africa or if you go to uh, South Asia, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult to find even somebody to give you an injection. <laughs> so, so the fact that you could provide a clinic which will be viable for most people, that is absolutely terrific. The worst thing that we worry about is injuring somebody or hurting somebody. So again, anyone with an active infection, we have to, we have to really look at it as surgeons and surgical risk. We don't want to have somebody with a horrible infection get worse because we're doing a procedure and introducing additional bacteria to their body in a different area. So active infection is something we would want controlled. Uh, but other than that, um, pretty much anyone's a candidate we're looking at all the data to see where it works. We're still learning. Uh, the, yeah, you mentioned uh, part of it, uh, that you are very careful that the individual that you're treating it doesn't have any kind of a dental or other infections that are ongoing and therefore could basically cause problems. Thank you for your presentation. I believe this is wonderful scientific breakthrough. This scientific breakthrough will improve people's right to health services especially for people in the third world. Despite some short, um, short time and costs needed to clinical operations, may I know how much time the cost and cost is needed to train a medical practitioner who would be capable of conducting and operating professionally and prudently as you guys? There is a website that um, is in our group. It's the Cell Surgical Network. Yeah, it's called Stem Cell Revolution. Yeah, so stemcellrevolution.com. Um, they have information for physicians there on how they can learn to do this. Okay. All right. So the next question is, uh, could, I think Dr. Dabat has already asked this question. They so, probably uh, send this to both you, you, you and me. Oh, go on. Okay. Can the S, um, is it the SV, SVF uh, therapy? Uh, treat patients that have suffered from long-term stroke? Yes. No, that's what I do not have. Yes, they certainly it can. Um, Dr. Durback knows my father. Um, yes. And he had a stroke about uh, 15 years ago, which left him uh, speaking kind of slowly and walking very slowly. Have you seen him or talked to him recently, Dr. Durbach? The, the, actually, I'm planning to shortly, but basically I, I have seen the degeneration. I have actually seen it wait every till, single time that I saw him. So wait till, wait till you see him. He's walking faster. He's speaking faster. Yes, I was he's talking with your mother. <laughs> Yes. I'm looking forward to me seeing him because I was very concerned about him. <laughs> yeah, it's very encouraging. And he received a stem cell treatment uh, over here at the California Stem Cell Treatment Center. And eight weeks later, he was walking more like a normal human being. He had a very short shuffling gait. And that's 15 years. We didn't expect that really to, uh, to change. But obviously, there was, uh, it doesn't look like he had scar in that area but he uh, had a lack of stem cells. And um, it, much to our surprise, uh, he's greatly improved. Even 15 years out, we couldn't believe it. You never know. I think that's absolutely marvelous. I, I can't wait uh, to see him and to, uh, and to be able to, uh, <laughs> to show the, uh, to see the improvement. It will be just terrific. I'll see him next week. Um, but, but realistically, after a stroke or a heart attack or any kind of trauma or injury, broken bones, you want to time the stem cells very quickly after the injury or the incident so that the organs heal with the right tissue. So heart, you want to heal with, heal with heart tissue, not scar tissue. Same thing with brain or bone or what have you. Okay, great. Have you, interesting, have you done any um, research or any uh, study with uh, cancer patients? We have, 
um, there, um, you can actually go to the uh, um, Stem Cell Revolution website and look mm -hmm. at our publications and uh, you'll see some studies that we did on, um, on cancer. One last Thanks. question that I wanted to ask the doctors, uh, which came in and I thought it was very important based on what they had uh, just uh, said. Could the SVF uh, procedure be used for autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid yes. arthritis? If so, is there a database with a list of clinics that perform this uh, technology and where patients can sign up? Mm -hmm. The, the answer is absolutely. We treat autoimmune diseases of different types all the time. We do have actually uh, very good data on that. Uh, it, and it's with it, one of the big things we're studying um, in, our, uh, in our network. So if you go to stemcellrevolution.com again, you'll, you'll be able to look at all the information and the things that we're studying. And there is a list of clinics that is easily accessible from that website. And uh, you know, we, we call other physicians to join us, help participate in research and help heal people around the world and gather data um, so that we can really look at what needs to be studied by the universities as well and join forces with everybody to make people better. So uh, at this point, I would say thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Lander and Dr. Snicky for a wonderful presentation. And I really do hope that uh, um, many, many people will be able to take benefit of what is going on. So thank you. And um, I'm grateful that you were able to be with us. And I also wish you a wonderful day and hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye.